And what has happened with the trends? Um, before the 50 cent fare, and this is pre-1983, ridership was going down. And then we passed, or before 1980, we passed Prop A, and for the first few years, revenue went into, uh, into the pot to, keep the, to bring the fares down to 50 cents. Ridership shot up during that time. After 1986, when we shifted that money from the 50 cent fare over to building rail, ridership, when rail priority has been really the, 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 the dominant pri uh, policy in the county, ridership has gone down. Ridership went back up after the BRU consent decree. It was very effective because MTA was forced to put more money into buses. Looked at another way, here's what happened on a yearly basis with our ridership. Again, we can see where it went down. 50 cent fare shot way up. Uh, rail priority shot way down. And then with the consent decree, uh, consent decree, ridership went back up again. And now that the consent decree has ended, ridership is going back down. Um, when we look at the capital subsidy, for these different modes. We can see here, probably the rail average is the most important, $12.90 per passenger, whereas the bus takes about $1.93 uh, uh, per passenger subsidy. So it's much cheaper to subsidize the bus. Now, if we're looking to attract people out of their cars and onto transit, how much does it cost us per new transit trip? These, these uh, charts, by the way, are Tom Rubin's charts. He, does a lot of great statistical analysis. I have to give them a lot of credit. Um, again, the rail average to attract somebody out of their car and onto the rail is about $25.79. Whereas the consent decree measures, we can see it was called CD bus, $1.40 to attract somebody onto the transit. And the Wilshire Rapid is uh, only 95 cents. Those are very cost-effective, yet effective, uses of public money. And again, we have to go back to those goals that I first talked about. What type of transit is better serving the people who need it? We've had to cut service in many cases to pay for the rail. We've raised fares. And what type of service do we achieve our environmental goals with? We only achieve those environmental goals if we're getting people out of their cars and on to transit. And since we've had a drop in transit ridership per, per resident by 20%, we're not achieving those environmental goals. So what would we rather see? What could be more effective? Um, simply more local buses could be the most important thing we could do. This isn't sexy, it's not ribbon cutting, but it's pragmatic and it's effective. People simply need more service, more buses, so that they can walk to a bus stop that's maybe closer and not have to wait as long for a bus. And if you have to transfer, when you get off the bus at your transfer stop, you don't have to wait very long for the next bus to come along. Very practical. We need more neighborhood buses. Buses that take people closer to where they want to go and pick them up closer to their homes. The Metro Rapid service, and the MTA deserves a lot of credit for Metro Rapid. It's groundbreaking, it's uh, nationally significant, and it's been extremely effective. Uh, more of that type of service on more lines would be a, a very practical solution. Um, smart jitneys, which would really be some, something, like, something like Super Shuttle, which uh, you can call in and say, I'm going from this neighborhood and going somewhere else. Can I, can I get a ride? And they'll stop and pick a few people up along the way. Um, could play a role in transit in Los Angeles. Lower fares would be very effective in attracting people out of their cars and getting more people into transit. And of course, pre-board pre fare payment, I think, is one of the next steps on our, in our bus service improvement to uh, reduce the time at the bus stop and to speed the buses up. Um, the dedicated bus lanes, as uh, Francisca said, I think a whole network throughout the county um, is something where really should be a, a priority for us. And then a bus on freeway network with stations along the way, something like the Harbor Freeway, um, but our whole freeway network with those, and then transfer stations at the interchanges, so that you could have regional trips and transfer from one to the other. 
and simply improving bus stops with our maps and schedules and better lighting and places to sit and so forth. And looking historically back at what could have happened instead if we'd have gone this way, we could have pretty much doubled bus service with the same money that we've spent on rail. Imagine what, you know, buses that now run every 20 minutes could run every 10, those that run every 10 minutes could run every five, and this would be a serious improvement in transit countywide. We could have lowered fares, we could have pre-board fare payment, more neighborhood service, a freeway network of buses, and we could have much higher transit ridership and thereby achieving more of our goals. Now just looking at our current plans, um, high priority to extend the gold line to Claremont, a really suburban line that does not demonstrate um, the need for, again, the collective transportation. Expo line to Santa Monica, the purple subway line subway to the sea, to our west side or the sea. Second purple line from Hollywood, the Crenshaw line now. I mean, I used to think, okay, you know, we, we fought, we lost. Build your red line, finish the blue line, green line, and then we can focus on the bus. But there's always another line that comes up. So we need to fundamentally change this philosophy because the direction has not changed. We're going to give us more of the same, higher fares, lower ridership, and less service to the transit-dependent people. Now, on a national perspective, um, nearly every metropolitan area is planning a light rail system. They all have sort of bought off on, on this as the solution. But they're having the same results. Washington, D.C. is one of the few cities that's actually invested in rail transit in the last few decades that's seen an increase in ridership, but they've done it at great cost. Um, most other cities have had a drop in transit ridership after their investment. And at the same repetition of inequities. I recently took a tour in Denver um, with, of their new light rail system. And this system has a line that goes way out to the suburban areas, some cities that aren't even built yet. There are few people on the line. And there are, you know, upper middle income white suburban neighborhoods. That afternoon, after that tour, I took a local bus just to go somewhere in Denver, and it was like here. It was packed full of African American and Latino passengers that really had substandard conditions to, to ride in. Um, so the same thing is happening in cities across the country. I just wanted to close by saying what I think our budget priorities ought to be. I think obviously we ought to fund uh, bus improvements instead of rail. I think uh, we also ought to shift. It's not just the bus and rail. It's not just within transit. This highway pot that Francisco talked about is very, very important. That's where there's a bigger pot of money to be had. We shouldn't be building new freeways. We're spending a billion dollars to add one lane on the San Diego freeway in the Sepulveda Pass, which two years from now will be filled up, or two years from after it's open will be filled up. What's the point? Or this underground 710 to Pasadena, billions of dollars on something that, what do we achieve in an area of global warming? I, th I think it's a big mistake. So pedestrian and bicycle improvements could make a, a big difference, and uh, I, with that I will, will close.